Hello everyone and welcome to our second program in this series on childhood and adult obesity. I'm the host, my name is Chip Gubera. Welcome. Um, the purpose of this series is to enhance communication between local experts on obesity, city officials, and community members like you guys here in the audience. Uh, this project was made possible through the City of Columbia Public Communications Funding Program. I would like to thank the City of Columbia. Let's give the City of Columbia a hand, huh? <laughs> the Public Communications Advisory Committee, the CAT staff, the CAT board, and of course all the wonderful CAT volunteers. Let's give them all a hand, huh? Great. Tonight we have uh, Tim Reinbott um, with us, and uh, he is going to give his presentation on uh, the backyard gardening for exercise and better nutrition. How this is going to work is I am going to tell you guys a little bit about Tim, and then Tim's going to give a speech, and then we are going to open up to questions from the audience, both here in the studio and you in TV land. And uh, if you guys would like to call in with a question, there will be a number at the bottom of the screen that you can call in and uh, we'll get you on. So please call, because um, once again, the whole point of this is to try and get the community involved with the experts as much as possible. So we really want to hear your questions. Okay, so Tim Reinbot serves as the superintendent of the MU Bradford Research and Extension Center, which is southeast of Columbia. He is involved in a range of projects that include uh, production of local food for MU's dining services. So if you've ever eaten at the dorm, you might have sampled some of his wonderful homegrown vegetables. Uh, he is heavily involved in developing techniques for integrating Bob White quail habitat management with modern agriculture in a way to kind of keep the uh, the quail and the farmers kind of working together and liking one another and uh, in a way that's actually inexpensive for the farmers as well. Uh, he's also involved in promoting native plants for use in landscaping as well as to clean up water rain off in rain gardens or provide seeds and insects for birds. Uh, his research includes uh, whether production of biofuels and wildlife can coexist here in Missouri, uh, which of course is very important because biofuels could actually start wiping out and making deserts out of our grassland if those are very harvested, so a way to really coexist once again. Uh, and finally, he hosts a number of community events at the Bradford Research Farm, such as the Native Plant and Quail Field Day and the Tomato Festival. So uh, that's Tim Reinbaugh, and I would like to now uh, introduce you all to uh, Tim Reinbot. Tim, take it away. Thank you, Chip. You know, I kind of look at this more like a fireside chat, except in, in the summer, you know? So we should have a little fireplace back here. But uh, you talked about uh, campus dining. Uh, we do sell tomatoes, melons, cucumbers, and what have you to, to there. And, my daughter was a freshman this past year, and I got a phone call about September 15th or so. She said, hey, Dad, did you sell some specialty melons to campus dining? I went, yes. Well, I'm eating one right now, and it's great. So we like, really like hearing that feedback uh, from the students, and we have a lot of fun doing that. Well, I want to talk to you today about what you can do in your own backyard for, your, for better nutrition as well as for some good exercise. Um, I asked, I had one of the community activities that, that we have is that we're partners in education with Blue Ridge Elementary. And we had three or 400 students out a couple weeks ago and I was talking to them about backyard gardening. And I asked them who very famous right now is planting their very first garden. And every single group I had said Michelle Obama and their children, and that's true. It has really caught on. And the reasons it's caught on is for nutrition for exercise, and you know, it's, it's time that we got back to that. Uh, we, many of us in my generation, we grew up slaving away out in the garden. And my wife's gonna kill me when I say this, but she won't hardly do it anymore because she had to do it so much. Because back in the day, 
when we were children and before, if you didn't produce enough vegetables, you didn't have any vegetables for that winter and so on. So it was very, very important. Now we've gotten spoiled and, and we've gone past that, but now it's time, let's go back and see what we can do. So first of all, can I have a first slide or so? It, okay, good. Well, um, backyard gardening is a four season process. Many people think, well, it's just spring and, and summer, but really it starts each fall when you are going to start preparing for next year. For example, when you're, going to, you're going to do your primary tillage, you're going to uh, get ready, your, your, your plot's ready, you're going to clean up what you had before, and you're going to make that final harvest. Now, when we talk about our primary tillage, I always tell people, don't be afraid to use a, sho a shovel. Everybody wants to use a, a mechanical device. You don't need that. Uh, I don't even own a garden tiller at home. You know what, I, I, use, I use a shovel. And you don't really have to have anything, and you can really uh, burn a lot of calories and do a lot of, a lot of deep thinking out there. Uh, many times my wife says I come up with some of my worst ideas when I'm out by myself doing, doing that. But in the winter, what's there to do in the winter? Well, and also in the fall, compost. In the fall, you'll have a lot of your uh, excessive materials. You can compost that. And we're going to talk about composting in depth here just a little bit. But in the, in the winter, you still have that compost. Don't forget about that because you still have kitchen scraps, you have what have you, you can still be putting those in. And also, this is a time to do a little dreaming and scheming and maybe do some of those building projects. And we're gonna talk about raised beds, we're gonna talk about vertical gardening. All of these can be done in the winter and that's some great exercise that, that you can have. Of course, the spring and then the spring rush comes. And uh, we have our secondary tillage, of course, as well as our, our planting, harvesting of our, of our cool season crops. You know, right now, a lot of them have started to come off in, in force right now. And of course, we still have our, our ongoing composting. And in the summer is when we get the, reap the benefits of what we have in our, our vegetable production. And, but we also got to remember, we've got to watch the width with the watering if, if, if needed. And also we need a scout. And how many people have great intentions in the spring, plant a beautiful garden, and then it grows up in weeds or, or the pests get it? Because you've got to worry about it. You've got to do daily scouting and, or even weekly scouting. So let's start off. Let's go to the next slide. I look behind me from time to time. Are we on that? All right, tilling the soil. Now, we talk about the fall tillage, that's our, that's, our, that's our primary tillage, and you don't really even have to do any tillage. You know, we, we grew up with that, with that concept, we, you know, what did we till? To control weeds, to make a, a, a nice uh, seed bed, but we can get away from that if we want to. Or we can go to a, a reduced tillage, and you see the picture of the young lady, and she is using a broad rake. And this is a, a bit more non-destructive um, way of tilling the soil. And it's a lot of good exercise. A lot of people do it up in the northern part of the United States and out in the eastern parts where they have a little bit better soil than we do naturally. But we can work on, on building that up. <clears throat> now, I know, many of you out there have heard of Elliot Coleman. He uh, is out in Maine, and he's written several books on how to grow vegetables year round. But he's also sitting in some pretty good land. He's, he's got, he's got an, an advantage, but we got an advantage too. We have a longer growing season than he does. So we can utilize that for our, our, our own self. Now in the springtime, of course, we have our secondary tillage. And that can be as simple as using a rake. Just leveling that soil up that, that we tilled up before. And uh, adding our compost, we, have, or we, we may want to work that in. But we also may want to have cover crops. And we're going to talk about cover crops in a little bit and how we can incorporate those in, into the soil to add nutrients, to help hold the soil, and do lots of good things. All right, let's have our next slide. 
Now this is also what we can use instead of planting in the ground. Well, I was talking earlier to some of the audience members. Some have very small gardens. Some have very a potential, Brendan, potential for a, for a very, very, very big garden. But the problem with it sometimes, it gets out of hand. Well, maybe we can scale back and have a raised bed and, very, and be very intensive about that raised bed. So out at our research farm, as part of our outreach and extension this year, we, we built three raised beds that we want to compare and contrast different methods of, of production and what have you. And it's good exercise. I could, you can see the uh, bruises on my hands from building these things, which, which, is, which is very, very good. But we build them to the point that we can fully utilize them, that we can uh, plant very deliberately what we plant, when we plant it, and also our, our harvest. And we can look at um, where we have a very soil-based mix, very inexpensive, where we use our, our topsoil and mix it with a little compost, or we can go totally opposite and go a soilless mixture. Now, this is a bit more expensive, but we're going to see what kind of rewards does that have for us. Because to the point, uh, some of this is so loose that you can stick your hand all the way down in there. Now, our root crops, of course, would love this. When you get a seed packet, what is the first thing that it says, the type of soil that you should grow? Loose. Do we have loose soil here in central Missouri? No, we really don't. So by using these raised beds, we can have that first step is that loose bed. Now there's, I found some drawbacks already. Soil, top soil is, uh, holds a lot of good water. water. Soilless mixes don't. Now you might ask me, what in the world is in a soilless mix? Well, it's going to be very heavily in compost. It could be this particular one that we're using has cotton burrs in it. It has peat moss in it. It has some um, rice hulls. For nutrients, we have uh, alfalfa meal, bone meal, blood meal, and a whole host of uh, different sources that, that, we've, that we've mixed together. Whereas our soil one, soil contains quite a few nutrients naturally. So we don't have to get quite so much on that, but we do mix some compost to give that good aeration. So we are comparing many of those, and we're also comparing using synthetic versus our natural uh, fertilizers. When you make a uh, raised bed, now we use concrete blocks, and we made them too deep, about, about 16 inches. You don't have to go to this expense. You can use wood that you have around, but you don't want to use CCA because one of the components of that, of the old CCA, was arsenic, and we don't want to have that leached into our, our, our food. But we do, we could use anything that we have around, and we don't want to get to a lot of expense on this either. So be creative. That's one of the things in the winter that you can do. You can look around, see what people are throwing away. That, that can be used as, as part of your uh, raised beds. Okay, let's move on to the next one. This is planting. Okay, we can plant seeds. We can have transplants. We can start our seeds inside our, um, our, um, how, our, our homes. Or we could have our own little greenhouse in the back, which, which would be a lot of fun. And I invite you to come out to Bradford. I did not bring a photo of this, I don't think, of our solar greenhouse. It's a one, it's a passive solar greenhouse. It's a wonderful way to start some plants in and it uses no net energy because we use the sun heating up water to capture the heat and that's what keeps it going throughout the, the, the winter. But I encourage you to grow your own. How many of you all ever go to a uh, nursery and get kind of frustrated? It's the same varieties every time, aren't they? And some of them are, are, have been around forever. And yeah, they, they have some good qualities about them, but there are others out there that are just as good, if not better. And I encourage you to look through your seed catalogs because that's where you can find many of your, of your new and some of your old ones that you can rediscover. Watermelons, for example. How many people need a 23-pound watermelon? You're not going to eat it all, are you? You really only need a five or six pound one. And that's where you can find those at. Look in your seed catalog 
and also be creative. Don't, if you don't know what something is, try it out. I have to admit, um, I work with some of the students, and we, we I, saw a, I saw a photo here a little bit of some of the stuff that they're growing, and we both grew Swiss chard for the first time. And the question was, do we eat the leaves or the stems? And I went, yes. You know what? I wasn't really sure. I, cause I had to think about that for a little while. And lo and behold, we let it go too long. It was still okay, but we let it get, we thought, the bigger the better. No, that wasn't quite true. But yes, we have learned some things from that. Uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, weeding, yes. Hey, you're getting right on this, Wes. This is probably one of the jobs that most people hate to do. But you know what? It's one of the most important. Because how many, as I mentioned before, good intentions start in the spring and the weeds take over. It happens last year, prime example. Every time we got a rain, here they came, over and over, flush after flush. I, love, I have one of these at home. Some people call it my Kentucky Big Wheel. I always call it a push plow. But if you can attack those weeds when they're an inch or less with something like this, it's a lot of fun. It's great exercise. You can push it through your garden and you don't even realize that you've done anything. And, and you, keep, you can keep your garden very, very clean, but you've got to keep on it. You can't let them get very big because the little rakes on there won't do a whole lot of good. And of course, you have your regular hoes and there's a tremendous number of, of types of hoes out there. And when you use a hoe, don't act like you're killing snakes out there. Remember, you, you want to gently disturb the soil because you don't want any, any more weed, weeds to come up. And as I mentioned, the younger you control the weeds, the better. And it doesn't take too many weeds to spoil it. Because remember, how many thousands of seeds each one of those plants can produce? So if you let one weed get, get by you, you've pretty well lost it. And I had a friend one time whose garden just went the pot and was just so upset. I said, you give me two mornings and a sharp hoe, I'll get it cleaned up for you. You take your time, you get a sharp hoe and for a couple hours at a time and you can clean it up. So it can't always be just a disaster. You can just keep managing, just, just keep after it. Next slide, Wes. Pest management. Now this is where we, get, we come to some crossroads because there are several options. You know, you can have the prophylactic way of just spraying no matter what you want to do, and you might do a good job, or you can not do anything. In both situations, I think you're going to have a disaster waiting to happen. Because we know if, if we get carried away with sprays, we can, we can get resistance, we can get other problems built up. And if you don't do anything, you can also have some problems. So what we recommend is integrated pest management, IPM. And this is where it takes a lot of scouting, but you also consider the weather conditions, you consider the life cycle of the pest that you're looking at, and you can also consider what's toler tolerable. And also think about what can you do to eliminate this pest. And this approach can reduce or even eliminate any type of pesticides that you might want to put down. Let's take, for instance, cucumbers. Cucumbers, melons, pumpkins, what have you. Just, just to go our audience, how many people have had disasters with those? Why? One of the reasons is this little insect called the cucumber beetle, and it's out already. I was talking to one of my friends, a horticulturist, he's already, he's already found one. They can wreak havoc on all our cucurbits because of the, of the disease that, that, they, that they have. So, starting right now, you, you scout your cucurbits. You see cucumber beetles, they have little stripes on them or little spots on them, pick them off and destroy them. Or, you, can, you should do that, you can also plant trap crops. Have you all heard of trap crops? These are crops such as Blue Hubbard. Blue Hubbard, Hubbard is a is a squash. It's a beautiful squash, plant winter winter squash, but insects love it. Plant that at the edge of your cucurbits. Guess where the the 
striped and cucumber meals go first. Blue Hubbard. Then you have your option. You could destroy the Blue Hubbard with the insects with it, or if you feel if you're okay with it, you could spray them and kill them. But this way, you keep it off your own cucumbers in a, in, in a way. Now, will this eliminate every squash? A cucumber beetle out there? No. You still have some. You still may have to do some hand picking, but it will reduce the numbers. Another friend of mine likes to lay out shingles or or pieces of board out, out in the field, out, out in the patch, because guess what? That's where they like to hide. That's a good place to find them and destroy them. Again, you reduce your numbers. So using integrated pest management can really help you increase. Also tomatoes. People love tomatoes, but how many times in August your tomatoes are fired all the way up? Those some leaf diseases. They start at the bottom and they work their way up. Now, we can help reduce that by putting down some uh, wheat straw, for example, because rain splashes, it splashes up, up on the leaves. That, that helps, that, that's what causes the fungus to get on, on the leaves to start with. Of course, cleaning. Now we talked about in the fall some things to do. We can clean up. If we have infected plants, make sure we, that we, we, we remove them. And maybe not really put them in our compost pile because we can keep some diseases going that way. But being clean, uh, using a straw, that can reduce it right there. Also scouting. It's getting humid. It's getting July. Temperatures are getting up. Humidity is getting up. Guess what happens? Your foliar diseases start. Scout, you start seeing a few on the bottom leaves, pluck them off. You've stopped it. Because remember, all a fungicide does is keep those that are uninfected from being infected. Plucking it off, you've also taken out, out, out the source. So there's, there are ways of doing this. And by knowing when you're going to get the disease problems or the insect problems, and knowing how you can go some simple methods, you can prevent a lot of unnecessary problems. Okay, let's go on to the next one, Wes. Oh, harvesting. Now, isn't this a beautiful photograph? Uh, Chip mentioned our tomato fest. I put a plug in right now for this. In se on September 3rd of this year, we'll have our fifth annual tomato fest. And Brendan here in the audience, he's helped with that. He's our, one of our official cooks. <laughs> because uh, what we have, we have tomatoes and we also have peppers. And this came about here several, like five years ago, because we wanted, what do people in mid-Missouri love the most? Tomatoes. And what goes with tomatoes? Salsa, peppers. So it grew from a tomato fest to also a pepper fest. So we will have about 60 different varieties of tomatoes and 30 plus different varieties of peppers. And this is an example of some of our tomatoes from a couple of years ago. We have everything from our modern hybrids to our heirlooms. And, our heir, and, some, of, and, and some of them, they're kind of weird. And, and, and again, one of the things you can do in the winter time, get your seed catalogs out, and the winter it looks, the better I like it. So we try some of those. And some of them taste wonderful. Some of our heirloom tomatoes are just absolutely wonderful. Now the problems with them, they, they may not produce as much. They may be a little bit um, more susceptible to some of the diseases, or they may have some waste to them. That's okay. That goes to the compost pile, doesn't it? When we have a little bit of waste. So we'll have that September 3rd where you can try, them, try all these different ones out. Uh, we'll also have experts there about tomato production. We'll have the peppers. Brendan, I hope, will be uh, grilling some of the hot, hot and mild peppers that we can, that we can all taste. And what do you, happens, you put salsa, oh, tomatoes and peppers together, a little onion, salsa. So we'll have uh, several salsas for people to sample. So that's, that's a whole lot of fun. And it's, it's really, really rewarding when you can uh, do something like this. And we sold a lot of these different types of tomatoes to campus dining. I say sold. And the reason we sell it, we take those funds and help fund student research projects. So it goes right back into the uh, students. We don't really profit from any of this. But harvesting, and that is some of the 
like I said, that's that's the um, the benefits that you get. It's great exercise, bending down, uh, stooping, bending, and you can just have quite a little workout doing this. And I mentioned about gardening. How many calories do you think you burn? They say an average 150 pound person burns around 300 calories per hour doing that. I bet if you're using that broad rake or a shovel or sometimes bending over picking green beans, it's a little bit higher than that. But it just depends on how, how fast you want to work. And also, I talked about seed catalogs. And you can spend about $50 in different seeds for your broccoli and your cauliflower and your melons and what have you. And they say if you do it right, you can get about $1,200 back in produce from that. If you get one of these raised beds, that might be even more because then you can be a little bit more intensified. And I've got to tell you about that. I'm even trying some intercropping with that. Uh, that's a photo from a few weeks ago where we have our cabbages and broccolis. Well, I've also intercropped some sweet potatoes in there, some more warm season crops. That way I can take full advantage of the space that I have. So what do you do when you harvest? You always have extra. And some of it may not be good and it's overripe or, or maybe some insects did bother it. What do you do with that? It goes to your compost pile, right? You can always add more and more to that compost pile. Okay, let's go to the next one, Wes. Nutrition. Now, this is what's very important. And one of the reasons why we grow our own plants is because of nutrition. Yeah, we, imp we, we improve the freshness of it. We also can improve the nutrition. When do you think that tomato that you're eating in March that came from California or Mexico, what do you think it looked like when it was picked? It wasn't bright, juicy red. It was green, maybe have a blush on it. A friend of mine has a vegetable farm around Truxton, Missouri. And his uh, MO is that he furnishes St. Louis area with fresh tomatoes that are vine ripened tomatoes that are ready to eat when he sells them to you. Of course he has a lot, he has to get some migrant workers in and he has to retrain them every year that you pick a tomato that is ripe, not that has just a, a, a hint of red to it. Because even though they say, yeah, they're ripened on the way, you know as well as I do, if they're not in the sun, they're not attached to the plant, they're not going to have all the vitamins, all the enzymes going, all the processes going to really make that flavor jump out at you. Also, nutrition-wise, do you think it's as, it's as good? I was shocked. I did a little bit of research, and they'll say, well, really, frozen veg vegetables that you can buy in the store are probably more nutritious than the fresh ones. I went, what? What? But think about it. If they are frozen, that means they were picked probably when they were ripe and processed and frozen. Those that came from a thousand miles away aren't fresh. So really, it's really surprising. But what you can do in your own backyard, you can wait till they're perfectly ripe. And my wife, I don't know how many times she'll, she'll get on to me because I'll see, the, I'll see it's 90% red, I'll pick it, it has a yellow spot on it because she always wants me to make sure they're totally ripe. Well, sometimes you just can't do that, can you? Even, you do miss a few. Also, if we talked about IPM with pesticides, you control what you put on it. If you don't want any pesticides, wonderful. It's going to take some scouting and a little more work, but that's great. That's what you can choose. Or if you grew up with um, carbamyls, you know, maybe seven, and you're comfortable with that, then you, then, you, then you can go that way. But it's up to you and not someone else. Like I told the kids, if you've got six to a dozen tomato plants in your backyard, sure, you can pick off the hornworms. Sure, you can pick off the fruit bugs. Sure, you can the leaf float, uh, take off the leaves. If you've got a hundred acres of them, thousands of plants, you probably can't do that. So that's why you get the control what goes on out there. And I'm, I'm using my cheat notes from time to time, just in case I, that I forgot something. Oh, and like I always said, try something new. Don't not ever be hesitant about that. Okay. The soil. This is the 
Weed control and the soil are the two most important things. I just recently saw a farm magazine that said the, the best places to farm, the 500 best counties. Guess what part of the United States they were? In the north, Minnesota, the Dakotas of all places, in northern Iowa. I thought, why in the world do you want to farm there? It's cold up there. But what does cold weather do? It keeps the organic matter from decomposing. It goes up. We have about 2 to 3 percent native organic matter, probably close to 3 percent here. When this prairie was first opened up, about 3 percent. Pretty good. Through tillage, which is not always the best thing in the world, it's gone down to about 2 percent. Most of you all out there, when your house home was built, they stripped the topsoil off and sold it to, to your neighbor. So you're left with, left with the subsoil that has about a half percent organic matter. And this organic matter is what separates us from Iowa and many of the other states. Their native organic matter is five to six percent. They still are working with about that much. Makes tremendous differences. Even though our, our, our growing season is much longer, we can grow a lot more than they can. Because of that lower growing season, we don't have the production because of that. And what does organic matter give us? It gives us nutrients, because as that decomposes, it releases nutrients. It gives us water holding capacity. It gives us aeration. Our soil structure is better. It gives us um, many, many different things. And I encourage people to do what we can to increase our organic matter. Now, we can do this by green manures, uh, cover crops. We can go with grass cover crops. Grass cover crops are wonderful. And what do we have up here? We don't have anything else. Oh, and uh, we can go with uh, manures, using animal, animal, animal manures, or of course we can use compost. Let's hit the next slide if you don't mind, Wes. Okay, green manures are grasses such as rye, wheat, and so on. What do they do? They catch the nutrients. They add organic matter to the soil, of course, but they don't really produce any biological fixed nitrogen. They're, they're, they, they, they can be very important. They can also be very important for weed control. They can smother some weeds out, but you have to manage them quite just, just a little bit. Or legumes. Legumes are those types of plants that fix their own nitrogen or take atmospheric nitrogen from the soil. It's a symbiotic relationship and they can actually take nitrogen from the atmosphere and put it back into the soil. So when you look, use legumes like clovers or vetches, you can actually get free nitrogen into your soil. Also, both of these grasses and legumes will uh, add to your soil structure through organic matter. And they're also kind of pretty. But what you do with this in the spring is up to you. You can just mow it down, because once a a lagoon, like a clover or a vetch, goes reproductive, starts blooming, you mow it down, that's it. It's not coming back. Or if you want to do a little bit earlier, you could till it in. With the grasses, you could till it in, or you could just mow them down, and they could give you a uh, smother crop. There's lots of different ways and different things that we can do out there. And we can mow it, we could roll it. That's another option that we could do. How many of you have lawn rollers? Well, make some use out of that lawn roller and roll down your cover crop, it, you know, you'll break it down. And whatever this does, it gives you some good exercise. Let's see the next one. This is, this, I tried this this year, and I didn't do it right, because it, you'll trial and error, but I just heard about this and found about it out there, forage brassicas. And what they do, they're uh, <clears throat> radishes like you eat, except they get really big. You can plant them in the fall, early fall. They'll grow probably in this area to about mid-December and then the they'll winter kill. But in the meantime, they will put down a tremendous taproot that you can see. And our soils are very tight, a great way to loosen our soils up. And what they say, <clears throat> from what I understand, is by spring, all you have left is these holes in the ground. Nice aeration. I planted mine a little bit too late, and they didn't really get as big as I wanted to, but I'm working with these. You know, that's the nice thing about being at a research institution. You get to have fun. You get, that, you get to play with, with, with some different 
type of things. And we're going to try that more and more in both gardens and also in the field with our, with our grain crops. Okay, let's go to the next one. Other nutrients, uh, we can go with synthetic, uh, our synthetic nu nutrients, or we can go with our natural. Now, I mentioned our natural earlier for our, our uh, raised beds, our bone meals, or our alfalfa meals, or our blood meals, on and on. There's lots of different things that we can go with to get different um, nutrients from. And it's better to use them for, for this in our compost or what have you than going to a landfill. I cringe at the thought of how many grass clippings wind up in landfills. And how many people know that our own city of Columbia has their own compost pile? And you can purchase it. You can put it in there. Or you can go to the mulch site and make some of your own compost. So let's look at compost for a minute. Anything can go into your compost pile that's organic, that was living, and that could... In, that could be your food scraps, your lawn clippings, any type of garden refuse, or even some manures. You gotta be careful on, on your manures. You don't wanna get too hot or too much nutrients in, in there. But you also wanna have a, a nice balance of greens, like I mentioned, your lawn clippings, food, and what have you, and your browns, which is your straw, your leaves, and what have you. And you wanna put a little soil in there at the, at the very beginning because your soil contains all of those bacteria that we need and fungus and what have you to help break this down. And this is a wonderful way to get some good exercise year round. You can have a very static pile that you only turn once a month. You can be very active with it. You can turn it every day or you can turn it once a week, whatever you want to do. Because the more you turn it, probably the faster, faster that, that it's going to decompose. We want to bring it up to a temperature of 120 to 160 degrees. This kills the weed seeds. It kills maybe many of the pathogens. And also, if you're having any type of manures in there, it can kill those pathogens like E. coli that, that can become real problems. And I want to say right now, you do not want to put straight manures on your garden without composting them first because you could get into those troubles, especially start using the root crops and what have you. Um, <clears throat> and when we do compost, we want to do layers of each. We want to do our, our greens, our browns, and a little soil, and keep stacking those on top of each other, and then mixing, mixing them from time to time. And it can, you can make your simple bin yourself out of some woven wire, wire or some used pallets, or you could buy one of these tumblers. And really, they all work on the same principle of aeration and heat. And that's what makes it work. Let's go to the next slide, and that's pest control. Oh. Pest control, sure. As I mentioned, uh, IPM, if you do want to use some organic type pesticides, there are some natural pyrethrins that come from chrysanthemums that you can use that, that do a very good job. There are also are some insecticidal soaps that you can use. But I learned a hard lesson. Greenhouse plants aren't as tough as outside plants. So you better watch it when you use some of your, uh, even your insecticidal soaps. You, you, you want to make them a little bit less concentrated. And of course, hand picking of your insects and your diseases. diseases. So if you're squeamish about uh, tobacco hornworms that you get on your tomatoes or what have you, you might want to get somebody to help you out with that because uh, they can get uh, pretty grotesque at time. Well, how can we... Oh, don't forget the pollinators. I just added this last night. Think back to your gardens of yesterday. My mother's garden, she always had flowers in the garden. I just thought it was to look pretty. Uh-uh, pollinators. And uh, Chet mentioned that we work with native plants. We work with a lot of the native plants, uh, how they could be pollinators. They attract beneficial insects, such as the pollinators, as I mentioned. But they also can attract those insects, like lacewings, ladybugs, that prey on other insects, such as aphids. So, so having, having uh, flowers intermixed with your vegetables, that's a good idea, because then you can help control some of your insects you can get better pollination, and it also looks pretty too, doesn't it? Okay, now, okay, 
extend that growing season. Because we get anxious, don't we? Well, one of the things that we're working with is by using just a, a row cover that you can uh, go out and plant your crops a little bit early. It's, put, it's like putting a little mini greenhouse over your plants. Uh, this maybe you could have the last few weeks you could have your plants protected, your tomato plants protected, for example. This gives you a little bit of, of a head start. Or back in March, early March, you could have your cabbage, your lettuce, and what have you out and by, and by using one of these. But this is a way that we can extend a few weeks in the spring and in the fall. Or we can go a little bit further if you look at the next, next one, and we can go with hoop houses. Now this on um, your right, that is the student garden that they planted back about the 1st of March in the hoop house. And you can see because it's protected, it grows tremendously. And there was no added fertilizer to this. It was just all compost that, 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 that we applied, and we have done no insect work on it either. So this is a great way that you can produce vegetables in your backyard, or you can uh, produce a lot of it if you want to get into the marketing. A 20 by 30 hoop house like this gives you about 1,000 pounds of tomatoes. I think you can supply the whole neighborhood with something like that. Or you can wrap it up into different ones, and that's about what they look like. Let's go to the next one. And we also can extend that growing season into the fall, into the winter. This is some lettuce that we took. And one of the photos I have, I don't know if this one or not, is snow outside. I took it in January. So you can have fresh lettuce year round. And guess what? If it gets too cold, you can put your road cover over your lettuce. So you can really extend that. And of course, uh, you can look at our, our tomatoes. And we had the flowers along with it to get some good um, uh, pollination there. Let's go to the next one. And if you want to come out and visit us sometime, here's our address and, and phone number and our website. We have lots of neat information on our website. So uh, I invite you to come out, give us a phone call. Hopefully after tomorrow or busy time will subside and, and we'll have some time to, uh, to, to spend with you all. And I'm going to open it up to some questions now. I think I've talked probably more than I should have, but to the audience or to the telephones. We go. I uh, also encourage, as we're waiting for our first speaker to come up, community gardens. If you don't have a big area, maybe your neighbor does. Maybe you can, can combine uh, your, your, your plot to other plots. Melinda. Hi, I have a bunch of questions. Um, homemade insecticidal soap, do you have a recipe for that? No, I don't. And some people have just came just putting a drop of dishwater liquid into some water will do some 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 wonderful but I don't really have one. Something with garlic or hot pepper yes. and making a bug spray with that? You bet. I was I was just at, at a uh, seed store this this week and they actually sell hot pepper insect spray. You can grow your own. Because all it is is it's just the uh, or the, the word escapes me. It's just so hot that it that, yeah. that it hurts the uh, insects. And I have another question about intercropping. Uh huh. Is there a formula for that? Like, what plants do you want to intercrop with others, and what is the timing for that? That's a good question. Um, I like to look at trying to. First of all, you don't want to grow alikes together. You want to stay away from that. That's why I put the sweet potato with the uh, uh, brassicas because they're so different, and. My timing, when I look at timing, it takes something like a potato a little while to get going. So, so you want to time it to, to where your uh, first crop is established but hasn't already taken over. You want to get that going so that way your uh, warm season crop has time to establish. And then you'll see it as it declines, it, 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 it will increase. I tell you what, trial and error is some of the best things that, that you can do. You'll make some mistakes, but you'll also hit some home runs. I have one more question. It sure. has to do with uh, double digging. Have you heard of that, where you dig really down deeply? And then I've also seen rows that are, you know, where you plant where the, the land is flat. And then I've also seen gardeners mound up the dirt. Mm -hmm. So what is this double dug kind of um, plant digging? And then also, is it advantageous to have these mounded kind of rows mm -hmm. rather than planting mm -hmm. f onto your flat ground. Sure, sure. First about double digging. The thing about here in mid-Missouri, 
we don't have to go very deep. Our soil gets bad fast. And we really can't loosen that up. We really, once we hit the clay soil, it's tight, it's going to stay tight. What we can do, though, is that we can amend above that and try to get the best that we can. Because we could make a bowl if, if, we, get, if we get too carried away. Yeah. Uh, the mounds, it's going to warm up quicker. That's the big thing. You'll have much, you know, it'll warm up quicker and, and it'll grow off. So that's, that's one of the best. I think we have a, a telephone call. Yeah. Yes. Hi, Tim. I have a question um, regarding what kinds of uh, vegetables will grow well in containers. Mm. Because I have a really small area and I don't have any, I don't have any land. I just live in an apartment. But I'd like to grow some vegetables in containers. And could you tell me something about doing that in pots? Sure. Pro the Probably some of the best vegetables that you can grow in, in our containers are, are, are warm season crops, such as tomatoes and peppers and what have you, because they have a, a good extensive root system that they can fill that pot up. And they can also, they're fairly tough. Tomatoes are kind of hard to kill. So uh, I, would, I would look more to our warm season crops, especially if you have a very sunny location that, that you can put them in. And you can feed them with, our, with your compost, or you can control um, how much water they get that way. Any more questions? Audience? Well, uh, we got lots of things going on, and um, Chip mentioned uh, some things that we do out there, and I talked about our tomato fest. But one of the things is trying to get everybody on the same page. And we have came a long ways with that, with our, uh, our modern agriculture and our conservation. And we want to try to get that also with our wildlife people. And that's why we work with our, with our native plants for uh, wildlife, for, for insects, for backyard gardening, and what have you. We also work with... Um, our bird watchers, it's a hot place for, 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 for bird watching and uh, always encourage people to come on out. But more questions out in the audience. Surely we have sparked, sparked some interest out there and we have one coming right now. Yeah, you know, I've uh, tried to grow peppers. I, everyone's uh -huh. talking about growing peppers. I can't get them to do anything. I've been trying to hatch them from seeds. I bought some plants and planted them with mm -hmm. some little banana peppers. And for about two weeks, they've still been the same size. I haven't been doing anything. That's a, peppers like warm weather. They're probably one of, our, one of our most warm weather crops that we have. And they're not as tough as tomatoes. So uh, really, my real thumb on peppers, I don't even think about putting them out to about 1st of June. Just to make sure it warms up good, the nights get warm, then your peppers can start going and take off. That's what I mentioned. That would be a good container garden because you can plant a little bit later, keep it a real warm location. Starting pepper seed, very frustrating, isn't it? Especially the, the cayenne peppers and the habaneros, those take a lot of heat, a lot of bottom heat just to get them going. And that's what we've that's what we've had to do with those. So that's excellent questions. Okay. You were talking about pest control. What do you do about first moles and then those little grub worms that are up under the soil that you don't see? Well, the moles are after the grub worms, and that's the problem. And if you can control the, 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 the grub some way, you can get rid of the moles. And my best on that is to get your, your, your a good cat <laughs> that likes to dig, because they will do a good job on that. Or chickens in your yard. I wanted to say that I have several books done by the Amish, and it has all kinds of formulations with soap formulas mm -hmm. and other things like that. I also will be doing some programs on Cat TV. I'm <clears throat> photographing others doing gardening. I'm going up and photograph the Amish doing gardening. And uh, I will produce a series of programs about what you can do. But one of the things that I wanted to say is when I was growing up, my mother and I would not only garden, 
when we'd go out in the fall in the local park and pick up all the walnuts and harvest a lot of things like that. That's another exercise that good. Yeah. We took gunny sacks and filled mm -hmm. gunny sacks and all winter long, my mother would say, time for a pineapple upside down cake. Crack the walnuts, John, <laughs> and then chocolate chip cookies. So mm -hmm. I do all of that. And uh, that's another thing. We have so much woods around here. There's lots of stuff you can gather, mushrooms being one of them. Yeah, real mushroom. Hickory nuts, uh, they, they make wonderful pies. And they're a good family. That, you know, gathering the nuts and wild, or, or the mushrooms, that's a great family, family activity that, that, that we have. Oh, Wes. I just had one, one quick one. I, I grew up in kind of a, a more rural town than Columbia. And mm -hmm. It was a ways out. I actually grew up in California. Um, but, Missouri? No, California State. Oh. Um, but I was just wondering, how does urban runoff affect the plants that, you know, live in, living here in the city? Um, does it affect mm -hmm. the water anyway? Yes. Urban runoff, water runoff, is really a tremendous problem. Uh, people way over-fertilize their lawns, to be quite honest with you. One of the best ways for a nice lawn is to mow it high. And people, I, I just cringe when I go out and see people scalping their yards and throwing tons of fertilizer on it and doing it over and over. That's not the way to do it. We mow our yard high on the highest setting that there is, and we have one of the most luscious lawns there is. Some people complain about clover. Why don't you want clover in your yard? It's fixing nitrogen. It makes it green. So um, I'm not up here. I like those mixes out there. So, yes, urban water runoff is, is, is bad. From, from yards, from uh, the oils, and that's where our rain gardens can come in. We have three rain gardens out at Bradford, and we stock them with, 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 with native plants to try to stop some of this urban runoff. Chip. Great. Uh, thank you, Tim, so much. Let's uh, give a big hand for Tim Reinbach, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you to the people with questions. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, we have two more programs uh, to do here uh, with the uh, childhood and adult obesity. And uh, the next one that we currently have scheduled is Thursday, July 9th. And that's going to be with Melinda Himmelgarten, who was just up here asking the first questions. And uh, she is a registered dietitian, newspaper columnist, and freelance writer and speaker. So we are lucky to have her, and she will be speaking on the socio-ecology model of childhood obesity. So that is, uh, that's going to be great. Once again, that's going to be Thursday, July 9th is the next schedule one. Um, to keep up with the schedules, please check with the CAT TV website at www.cat3.tv, and uh, we will post announcements. And, of course, if you contact the staff, you can get on the mailing list. Uh, it's a great way to do this. So, um, so yeah, so that's going to be what's coming up here. Um, so, uh, once again, thank you, Tim, for coming out and doing this. This thank is you wonderful. All. It was fun. And uh, I would like to mention that uh, financial assistance for this project has been provided by the City of Columbia and the Public Communications Advisory Committee. Let's, uh, let's give a hand for, for City of Columbia and the Public Communications Advisory Committee. Yes, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we have uh, our director is Andy Neitzert, uh, Neitzert uh, DP Ryan Walker, uh, audio Aaron Little, flow, floor, uh, floor crew, <laughs> oh my gosh, is Mike Miller and Chase Thompson, associate producer Mara Ar Arigetti. I've been Chip Gubera, and thank you, and have a good night, everybody.